Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar featuring MCT and MQMR on MSR risk management, service compliance, and current market trends and strategies. A uh, quick couple of housekeeping items here. Um, just letting you know that the, this will be recorded and we'll be sending out the recording and slide deck after the presentation is over. Um, as well as if you have any questions during the, the webinar, please use the questions panel and the GoToWebinar panel um, that you're viewing this from. Uh, please drop them in there. Uh, we'll do our best to get to those questions as the webinar um, goes on. If we don't have time for that, uh, we will answer them at the end of the webinar. And if we end up running a little bit late, we will absolutely follow up with everybody that has questions. Um, thank you for joining us, and without further ado, I'll pass it over to Mr. Bill Sheriffs. Excellent. Thank you very much, David, and welcome everyone to the webinar. I'm Bill Sheriffs, the head of MSR Services and Sales Operations with MCT. Uh, we appreciate you all being here. Uh, for those of you that might not be familiar with mortgage capital trading, uh, we are the industry's leading hedge advisory firm. We have the largest mortgage asset exchange platform for the U.S. secondary market called NCT Marketplace. Uh, the company is well known for delivering innovative solutions across the capital market space, uh, including uh, MSR. Uh, what uh, I think what we've got, uh, I think, is a very interesting agenda plan. Uh, covering a multitude of MSR topics, including uh, different perspectives on uh, the market, current risks, compliance, trends, uh, and much, much more. But uh, before we uh, get started, I do want to take a, a quick minute here to thank our partners from uh, MQM Research for collaborating with us, uh, for initiating this, and spending uh, time with us to, uh, to build out this presentation, which I think uh, will be uh, well received by all the folks that uh, have dialed in. So, uh, Julie and Scott, and the rest of the QM research team, I thank you very much for that partnership. Um, so uh, let's take a minute to, to meet the speakers. I think we uh, let's move to that the slide if we could. I'll just take a minute to uh, walk us through who we've got. Uh, Julie McCurley. Uh, Julie is the director of servicing. She's been uh, with MQM Research for almost seven years in in the mortgage industry in both originations and servicing uh, since the uh, mid '90s. Then we've got uh, Scott Weintraub. Uh, Scott is the uh, VP of Compliance. I've been with MQM Research for four years and over 20 years of experience in legal and regulatory compliance and residential mortgage lending and the servicing industry. Then we've got Azad Rafat uh, from uh, MCT. He's the Senior Director of MSR Services for us. Azad is considered our MSR uh, expert and uh, our thought leader. Uh, he's an industry veteran with extensive experience in overall MSR portfolio management, valuations, modeling, strategy, uh, et cetera. And then Natalie Martinez. Natalie's our senior manager of MSR services at MCT, oversees a number of key functions for us, including client success, valuations analytics, and uh, model enhancement testing. And then lastly, we've got uh, David Burris dialing in uh, for us. He's our sales director of MSR services, another industry veteran with a breadth of experience, including uh, subservicing, mortgage insurance, and GSEs. He spent some time at, uh, at Freddie Mac. So a good group of uh, panelists. So uh, let's move on to uh, the, uh, the agenda, David, please. You know, as I said for uh, you know, a very, very uh, robust agenda plan, we're gonna be covering uh, some of the uh, top of mind questions uh, that, uh, that uh, we currently have in the market that we'll get into MSR compliance, risk management, and best practices. Julia will walk us through that. And then current MSR portfolio trends and uh, MSR risk management, that'll be as odd. And then servicing regulatory development, et cetera. On the regulatory side, Scott will uh, take a point on that. And Natalie will jump in uh, to uh, walk us through the uh, current trends relative to retain versus release, uh, some uh, differences relative to the uh, valuations uh, that we do, fair value versus market versus economic, and then a little bit about uh, co-issue. And then uh, David Burroughs will take up uh, the tail end here and uh, walk us through where we are with the uh, the, the bulk market. So uh, with that, let's uh, get into what are some of the key line questions uh, that uh, that we uh, currently have in the market. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, something that we hear a lot from our clients, have fair values uh, for existing MSR portfolios peaked? 
you know, rates uh, were at around 4% at this time two years ago. It's hard to uh, to imagine that, to below 4% two years ago, climbing to up around 8% uh, through October of 2023. And then what we've seen since October of last year until now, rates have declined 100 basis points. So that's uh, uh, quite a bit of volatility. So have uh, portfolio values peaked? Uh, that's a question that we'll get into. And then our wax for existing MSR portfolio is still increasing. You know, with rates continually and uh, consistently climbing, uh, those wax were increasing. But with a recent decline uh, of 100 plus, uh, what's happening with uh, portfolios and those uh, profiles? And then uh, what about float values? You know, with some of that interest rate volatility, how has that impacted the float values? And uh, as far as the, uh, the rate volatility, um, should we expect uh, an impact on the balance sheet, whether it's in pyramid exposure or uh, uh, overall asset value? What sort of impact should we expect? And then uh, why are portfolios uh, shrinking rapidly due to uh, principal pay downs? You know, are the low wax uh, impacting uh, the amount of uh, principal pay downs and the effect on portfolios? And then uh, what regulatory uh, changes targeting banks are under consideration? Well, it uh, would include the capital and uh, the, the percentage that uh, the largest banks can hold uh, of MSR on their balance sheet. What sort of impact uh, might that have on, on the bulk market? And then does the underlying quality of mortgage loans and data have a, an impact on successful compliance? Do, does it matter? Uh, that's a question that I know is uh, near and dear to Scott that uh, he'll be getting into. Uh, so uh, as you can tell, you know, we'll be covering a lot of ground here. I want to get uh, right into it. So I'm going to turn it over to Julie McCurley from MQM Research to review some topics related to MSR compliance, risk management, uh, and uh, best practices. So Julie, I'll turn it over to you. Take it away. Thanks, Bill. Uh, so before we jump into uh, the riveting topics of servicing compliance, and I bore you to death with the details, just want to make sure everyone has your afternoon coffee ready to go. Uh, I'll do my best to keep you awake. Um, as an audit consulting firm for the mortgage industry, uh, MQMR is happy to be here to discuss these very things that keep us all awake at night. And maybe down the road, you might find a need and figure out how we can help support you through the world of servicing compliance. And what we really try to do is strive to be your mortgage industry partner of choice for audit risk and compliance. And I don't have to tell this group that mortgage lending is heavily regulated by federal and state laws, as well as regulatory agencies such as the CFPB. And the importance of complying with these laws and regulations is mandatory to avoid legal consequences, fines, or even sanctions. But it doesn't hurt to remind you. <laughs> okay, um, now that we have the important stuff out of the way, let's start at the top and talk briefly about what's required from a servicing quality standpoint once you've decided to retain your MSRs. Whether you're a master servicer bravely servicing your own loans or you've hired a subservicer to manage your loans for you, the requirements for QC are really the same. If you're servicing your own loans, you're required to review all aspects of your servicing operations from federal, agency, and state directives, which I'll talk about more in detail here in a little bit. But we all know that can take an entire team to manage. Um, so if you decide to hire a subservicer to manage your portfolio, as a master servicer, although the objective is a little different in that you're required to manage and monitor the performance of your subservicer slash vendor, uh, the requirements for a monitoring program really are the same. We've even had some clients ask, <clears throat> but if I have a subservicer and they have a QC program, then why do I also have to have one? Well, here's the hitch in that. Your subservicer may very well have their own internal QC program and will likely be doing a 10% sampling across their entire portfolio. But you're not their only client. You're not the only master servicer or client that they're servicing. So the possibility of your loans coming up in their sample selection each audit cycle are pretty low. And that's why you should be focused on their performance against your portfolio specifically as part of your vendor management responsibilities in addition to master servicer oversight requirements. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the details of what's required within your QC program and by which regulators. 
Now, I think we all agree as a newbie first entering the uh, servicing arena, even production on the origination side, the first thing you learn is FHA is probably the most explicit when it comes to directives. Guidance for their QC program from FHA is no different. If you service FHA loans, including Ginnie Mae loans backed by FHA, FHA states, regardless of how many loans you're servicing, they must be reviewed monthly. So for a routine uh, standard timeline, monthly audits are required for FHA loans. You know, we believe the objective of this frequency is to kind of identify missing control sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, you're doing things like identifying root cause and implementing a remediation plan and all the additional controls that need to go into place. You wanna do that as soon as possible to minimize, if not alleviate future risks. Um, FHA also says, if you service less than 3,500 loans, you should QC a 10% sampling of your entire FHA population. However, if you service more than 3,500 loans, you can move to a statistical sampling of your entire population. Uh, I feel like I'd be remiss in not mentioning the bulleted list in the FHA handbook that provides clarity around all of the areas that should be QC. Uh, we like to call those AOIs or areas of inquiry, but there's a, a great little list there in the FHA handbook you can refer to. Now, when it comes to QC requirements for VA, I believe the VA guide states, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, um, you should be periodically assessing the quality of your loan servicing at least annually. So you have some guidance here in the VA guide. Uh, but the message is still the same, that a QC program is required. All right, let's chat about agency requirements. So Fannie Mae and their requirements for QC are a little different from FHA and VA. And while the Fannie Mae servicing guide speaks to what is expected should Fannie Mae come in to audit your portfolio, I'll point you to the Fannie Mae servicer self-assessment uh, when it comes to internal QC requirements and what's required for master servicers. So Fannie Mae says this, QC is typically done quarterly, and is done at a 10% sampling or statistical, the lesser of the two. Uh, so Fannie Mae also has a list of areas that you should be reviewing and you should make special note of uh, those AOIs. And then if we're gonna talk a little about Freddie Mac, while they might not provide specific guidance around timing requirements, the guide does say this, the servicer must regularly review and assess the adequacy of its internal controls, procedures, and systems, and using a mortgage sample size that reflects a meaningful representation of the UPV of total loans being serviced for Freddie Mac. They also include a list of areas that, be, that should be reviewed. Um, so from a selection standpoint, and really an industry standard, we always recommend doing a 10% sampling or statistical, the lesser of the two, on each loan investor type and doing your reviews monthly. Having said all that and kind of circling back to why a monthly review is the most proactive option, even if it's not required, as you all know, root cause and remediation can sometimes take months to identify um, and then even develop next steps. So if you're only reviewing your loans on a quarterly basis, that just means there's a much longer delay from the time you identify exceptions and even longer to remediate them. Okay, lastly, from a federal perspective, uh, what if you only service private investor loans? Does that mean you're off the hook and don't need a QC program? Absolutely not, here's why. So um, while there's nothing explicit in the CFPB examination guidelines around quality control, the CMR or the Compliance Management Review within the CFPB examination states, to maintain legal compliance, an institution must develop a sound CMS compliance management system program. Um, it goes on to say it should be part of your day-to-day -day responsibilities, but here's the key takeaway. It specifically states issues should be self-identified and corrective action initiated by the entity. So based on that definition alone, the requirement to maintain compliance by having a review program is most certainly an expectation. Because if you aren't QCing, then that means you're not self-identifying miscontrols and you're not taking corrective action as the directive states is required. 
But what the CFPB does define even more specifically is what they say about an effective compliance program that it contains and it speaks to both a monitoring and an audit program. And then it goes on to define each of those programs. One's a little less formal and can be done internally. And one is more formal, more frequent, and it should be done by a, an external vendor or someone independent of your compliance department. So it's pretty safe to say if the CFPB comes in to audit your shop, they're going to be asking you for evidence of one, if not both of the programs, audit and our monitoring. Um, it does speak to only requiring one for smaller entities, but what they'll do is they'll evaluate if what you have in place is sufficient based on risk factors such as your size, your complexity, your risk profile. Bottom line is you should have some type of QC or monitoring program as the CFPB Federal Director provides. And as a final note, if you're not doing any QC at all, then that means you have unknowable risks and those can be the worst kind. Uh, next slide, please. All right, now that you have the rundown of what must be done on an ongoing basis, your um, frequency and your selection models, um, I wanna share with you some of the most commonly missed items that my team identifies in our QC program across servicers. Right out of the box, probably no surprise, uh, boarding a new loan to a servicing platform, there comes quite a few risks to consider while you service the life of that loan. This is where missing controls can start and impact the rest of the servicing path in other areas of inquiry from escrow all the way to reconveyance. Um, if you don't get that loan boarded properly and accurately, you're gonna have issues down the line. In addition to um, other AOIs such as delinquent loans and escrow administration, new loan boarding is an area of inquiry where my team of auditors sees a good bulk of missing controls. You'll wanna be focused on the integrity and or accuracy of the data that's being boarded to your servicing platform. Critical data points such as borrower name, social security number, the loan information, the term, the UPB, the rate, but commonly missed is the correct amount that should be assessed for a late fee. Your staff should be comparing the allowable amount as it is listed within the note, but also what is allowed by the state and ensuring the lesser of those two is what's set up in your system. Now, I mentioned escrow admin and delinquent loans uh, as two other areas where missing controls are commonly found. Again, I probably don't have to tell this group what it's like to service a delinquent loan and all of those requirements that must be met when a loan goes delinquent. Uh, the good news is the CFPB and agencies such as Fannie and Freddie have streamlined a lot of the older requirements to provide more flexibility for you, the servicer, uh, when managing a delinquent loan, especially when it comes to delays and things like decisioning your loss mitigation uh, requests or even implementing loss mitigation approvals. But ultimately, as a servicer, you must ensure that in your processes, no harm is being done to the borrower. And every step taken is in the best interest of the consumer, which means providing all available and alternative options to cure the loan, ensuring it doesn't go to foreclosure before those alternatives are exhausted, and ensuring the consumer is educated and kept informed throughout the process. But we need an entire webinar dedicated to covering just those directives. <laughs> uh, lastly, while escrow admin is also a subject I think we could talk about for days, um, I just want to touch upon a few commonly missed items when it comes to managing your escrow accounts. I think some of the obvious things are ensuring you're not collecting more than the allowable cushion, you're paying taxes and insurance timely, and if paid delinquent it's, and it resulted in penalties, you're not passing those on to the consumer. But also items like the escrow analysis being completed annually, the timing of that notice and its content requirements, uh, directives around when there's a deficiency or surplus, and um, also how those deficiencies or surpluses are being handled and if they're being communicated to the consumer in your notices. If you have a vendor who manages your taxes and insurance, it's still your responsibility to manage their performance for all of those things. Well, I've only mentioned a few of the areas that keep services awake at night. There's a whole host of other directives that come from agencies, our govies, and the states, which all mandate how you should service a loan and the loan events throughout the life cycle of a loan. Keeping up with our ever-changing rules and regulations requires resources and expertise, 
and can be a huge risk to your shop. But in the end, if, you, if your QC program is not being executed properly, it creates reputational risk, but it can also result in monetary losses resulting from consent orders and fines. And let's not forget uh, the resources you'll need to manage those consent orders. All right, I'm going to take a breath now, uh, now that we've covered all of the QC requirements for servicing your portfolio. We're going to take a step back and Azad is going to speak to the risk management considerations that come with interest rates. Over to you, Azad. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for attending uh, the webinar. Uh, just wanted to address a few issues related to MSR, even though MSR uh, could have a lot of rewards owning the asset. Uh, at the same time, it comes with risk that we need to kind of oversee, manage, and control. Uh, one of the things uh, we normally look at, and uh, aside from analyzing the MSR and pricing those loans, we look outside in general to see what the economy, what's going on with the economy, what's going on with debt. I mean, right now uh, we're seeing a lot of transactions in MSR. For instance, during 2023, we saw about a trillion dollars in UPB exchange hands during the year and we expect a robust year in 2024 but then that's going to be uh, a wait and see scenario depending on what rates uh, what kind of rate environment we'll be going through that year one of the things we always monitor is the consumer debt consumer debt continue to rise uh, and right now reaching 18 trillion and it has a lot of potential implications on uh, performance, uh, i.e. refinancing, uh, i.e. delinquency. Uh, if borrowers become delinquent in uh, the credit card, for instance, that will have implication on potential uh, refinancing. All those things we look at, look at and monitor on a regular basis. We also started seeing consumer debt serious delinquencies rise. Uh, serious delinquencies, we consider it at 90 days plus. We saw that increase during uh, last quarter of 2023 by 38% to 1.42%. That may seem low, but it is low. But then at the same time, we're seeing that uh, tr increases trickling upwards uh, since the beginning of 2023. Uh, right now it's still low, but it's something worthwhile to keep an eye on. Uh, if you break down the total consumer debt delinquency, serious delinquency, we see the mortgage debt del serious delinquencies rose by almost 44% to 0.82. Credit card serious delinquency rose by 58%, 0.6 to 6.36. And auto loans rose by almost 20% to 2.66. All of those could play a role uh, in mortgage delinquency, as we saw back in 20, you know, 2007, 2008. We were monitoring those delinquencies, and sure enough, that trickled into mortgages as well. We do not expect the same level uh, of, you know, sharp foreclosures or delinquency as the economy experienced back in 2010, but definitely something to keep an eye on and monitor. Uh, 2023 was a solid year for mortgage servicers. We saw profitability uh, you know, during that year, even though production was low, uh, mortgage servicers were generally profitable. But at the same time, we saw that profitability started waning down a little bit. The question is, Will that continue to wane down uh, during 2024, or will it stabilize? And that's yet to be seen. Uh, fair values, when you look at MSR, fair values are generally robust, generally uh, strong. And for the time being, we expect it to remain as such. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide that represents mortgage rates from different sources. Uh, we saw the peak somewhere in October and November, and that's where the fair values peaked, in our opinion. And since then, mortgage rates uh, declined by about 75 basis points, but 
uh, ended that decline ended at the end of December of 2023. We saw a slight reversal uh, during January, and that continued through today. So, in general, net decline uh, from the peak is about 50 basis points. Even though it did not have material impact on the fair values, but that you know is something we need to uh, keep an eye on in terms of refinancing activity and so forth. Uh, even though we do not expect major refinancing. Uh, for existing portfolio, we saw a new trend going into HELOC loans, second mortgages, because a lot of the borrowers do not want to give up their uh, low WAC mortgages, and I don't blame them for that. But then at the same time, we started seeing more HELOC loans, more second mortgages, more uh, non-QM loans uh, for different reasons. So definitely, uh, even though we're seeing increases in those areas, it could materially impact the overall performance of current mortgages. So that's something we need to monitor. Next slide, please. This is a chart that shows the 30-year to the 10-year treasury and the spread between the two. During 2023, the average spread between the two indices was somewhere around 275 to 300 basis points. Uh, as of the beginning of the year, that declined to about 225. And depending on what the Feds will do, and if they start uh, reducing rates uh, in May or maybe later in the year, we should see and anticipate that spread to decline, also leading to lower mortgages uh, throughout 2023, at least the second half in 2024, and then maybe it will continue in 2025. Next slide, please. Uh, one component uh, that make up about 20% to 25% of the overall value is the float income from escrows and PI, depending on the investor remittance. And right now, we, uh, when we look at the MSR, that translates into about 20 to 30 basis points, depending on the type of loans you have, depending on the region. If it's agency loan versus Jenny May loan, as you know, Jenny May loans uh, require, uh, you know, most of the loans have escrows, uh, monthly payment in escrows, that translate to higher value component for that asset. Uh, right now, a lot of companies use anywhere from one month uh, sulfur all the way to five-year uh, treasury rate, and that still makes up about 20 to 25, maybe 30 basis point of that. If the Feds, and when the Fed decide to cut rate, we expect that float income rate to come down by 75 to 100 basis points. That said, that could translate in a decline in value associated with the escrows and the PNI flow, ranging anywhere between six to 12 basis points, almost half a multiple on agency related to, uh, to the escrow flow and PNI flow. So that's something to keep an eye on, even though prepayments will remain low, but this is a second component and variable that could impact the overall value. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the things uh, we always uh, discuss with our clients is the retention strategy. We saw a lot of companies during 2023 uh, retain anywhere from zero all the way to 30% of their production. Uh, and the reason for that, I mean, it, most of the production was in the seven, you know, six and a half to seven and a half percent, and that could become very risky to hold, and I totally understand that. But as we head in 2024, and current rates are on six and a half, six and three quarters, uh, companies should address this retention strategy. Uh, even though a lot of the aggregators are paying, you know, five multiple to six multiple in some cases, uh, it, it, it makes sense to retain some loan. And the reason for that, because even though fair values and basis points are relatively high and robust, the underlying principal balance has been deteriorating. Even though the prepayment 
actual payoff could make up about two to three percent of actual, you know, loans paying off. The principal amortization has been declining about the same level, two to three percent. The fact for that is low interest rate loan have higher principal payment associated with that. The other underlying factor is a lot of the borrowers uh, and, and recent analysis we've done, about 30% of borrowers make by month, uh, I'm sorry, uh, by weekly payment. Therefore, they have extra payment coming in every year. That further exasperate the principal pay down that we see in the portfolio. Even though the, prince, the value in basis points remain strong, the value dollar amount is declining and that could impact the balance sheet and at the same time the PL statement. The other thing is uh, the strategy surrounding balance sheet management. One of the things uh, we advise clients is to be reasonable and conservative in their approach and capitalizing OMSR. Uh, even though aggregators are paying, you know, five to six multiple, if you book it at those levels, expect to that for that value to be volatile because of the as rates move, that value will become very volatile. Think of it as a rubber band. If you stretch it to the farthest you could stretch it out and let go, it's going to snap back hard. The same thing with the fair value. If you stretch that fair value to its limit, the slightest change in uh, interest rate that could have, you know, a strong impact on the balance sheet and the PL. So, if you capitalize it in moderation, maybe four and a half multiple or four multiple, rate changes is not going to have a whole lot of impact on that volatility uh, for the asset. At the same time, if you capitalize at a high level, if you're using locom, you have to plan to amortize a little bit more than what you normally would. Even though prepayment is very low, you should amortize it slightly higher to offset for potential rate down decline. And this approach, the conservative approach, is commonly adopted by credit unions and a lot of the independent mortgage bankers. One of the things uh, we tend to overlook in the industry is the uh, performance. We, we have to continue to monitor performance, look at the 30-day delinquency, 60-day delinquency, 90-day delinquency. We have to continue to monitor those and manage those effectively, make sure loans, uh, you know, if they start becoming delinquent, we need to move fast and remedy that issue. So those are the things we have to think about on an ongoing basis. The same time, try to tie loan officer with loan performance. Uh, you'll find out that it's very effective tool managing and reducing uh, uh, volatility in that portfolio, i.e. lower delinquency, uh, lower prepayment. And we've seen that historically. Uh, at the same time, utilize as a portfolio grows, like once you start hitting the 5 billion and more, uh, or maybe if you have 20 billion in UPB or 50 billion in UPB, it pays to have multiple opinions on the value of that asset to ensure internal valuations are captured uh, relatively uh, you know, within reason. And this way, if you decide to sell the asset down the road, or maybe acquire more assets down the road, it will help you manage uh, that asset effectively. Uh, the other thing, bulk activity. Uh, bulk MSR is very critical uh, to managing the asset. I mean, a lot of times we just focus on, a, you know, originating loan, but origination may, sometimes may not be enough. We need to look at potential uh, bulk acquisition or co-issue acquisition to uh, revamp the portfolio. And at the same time, if you decide to sell, all these uh, activities will determine how much your portfolio will maintain that value. At the same time, the bulk price is, uh, could, you know, when you put portfolios on the market, 
we really don't know uh, what value you're gonna get from uh, those bulk activity, uh, all depending on who's coming to the table, the number of bidders, what type of uh, product you put in, uh, the WAC, the average UPB, the FICO score, all of those factors will determine the value associated uh, with that bulk activity. I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Scott to discuss uh, the servicing regulatory developments that are taking place currently and future development. Thank you so much. Thank you, Azad. Um, great information by all of the panelists so far. It's It's been great to listen to. We've heard a lot about what are some of the risks with MSRs from a quality perspective, what's going on with the market and interest rates. So I want to touch on for the next few minutes, what is developing, what has developed and what will continue to develop and change in the world of legal and regulatory compliance related to mortgage, mortgage servicing. And by way of introduction, I want to give you a quote from Rohit Chopra, the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, who at a conference a couple of months back said the thing that he personally is worried about most related to mortgage is mortgage servicing and how compliant or not compliant mortgage servicers are. So when we think about it in that context, while there's a lot of opportunity with MSRs to earn portfolios or increase your portfolio, and there's a lot of good things associated with it, you only get all the benefits of that if those loans are serviced compliantly. So let's talk for a few minutes about the what and the how, meaning what is it? What are the seemingly infinite supply of laws and regulations that need to be complied with? Again, as Julie mentioned earlier, whether you're a master servicer or that has someone subservice your loans for you or whether you're servicing them yourselves, either way, if they're your MSRs, you are responsible for ensuring that all applicable laws and regulations are complied with. So the fact that you have a subservicer who does the day-to-day -day work does not absolve you as the master of any responsibility related to federal and also state laws and regulations that govern mortgage servicing. So when we say that, let's talk about the what first. What's out there that if you have a portfolio of MSRs that you need to be concerned about that you're complying with those laws or your subservicer is complying with those laws and you have robust oversight and management in place in order to ensure that they are. So I broke it up a little bit, as you can see on this slide, with performing loans or the loans that I call on the happy path, the borrower is paying them and things seem good, and delinquent loans. So on the performing side, while it's great that the borrower is paying the loan back, the borrower might be happy, there are still a lot of different areas where you need to make sure you're complying with applicable laws and regulations, meaning there's a lot of ways that a servicer can be non-compliant, get in trouble in an exam with the CFPB or other regulators, with agencies like Fannie and Freddie, with anyone who might come in and look at your organization, even with performing loans. And I listed a few examples here of some of the key areas of focus. One of the biggest ones is servicing transfers. So when we talk about MSRs and pools of loans that may be purchased by you, your organization, and loans are transferred to you or to your subservicer from another servicer, the CFPB in particular is and always has been extremely worried about risks to consumers when the servicing for a loan is transferred. One of the things they're worried about is that the new servicer has all of the data and information about that loan from the, pre from the prior servicer. One big area is if there might be an application for loss mitigation that's in process at the time a loan is transferred from one servicer to another. The Bureau is concerned about two things. Number one, and most importantly, that that application will still be considered when that loan gets to the new servicer that it won't get lost in the shuffle and the borrower might get foreclosed on instead because their application was lost or didn't transfer. Secondly, if the borrower has provided documentation related to that application to the prior servicer, 
the Bureau doesn't want the new servicer to request the same documents from that borrower that they've already provided. So again, they're looking to control and eliminate where possible risk to consumers. Billing statements or periodic statements is another big area of focus. There are a lot of specific requirements for what needs to be on those. Also with payments, are payments applied, applied properly? Are they applied timely? Meaning the date that it's received by the servicer. And if the payment isn't a full payment, what does the servicer do then? And obviously escrow is another huge area. For those loans where the borrower is paying in to you, the servicer, for their property taxes and insurance, are those escrow accounts being managed properly? Are the premiums being paid and timely? Are the property taxes being paid and timely? And are the escrow analyses taken, taking place on an annual basis as needed and applicable? And is that information getting back to the borrower? So those are just a few examples on the performing loan side. And of course, there's also rules that apply on the delinquent loan side, when the loans fall off what I call the happy path. So there's the FDCPA, the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, which governs how a servicer can go about communicating with borrowers in an attempt to collect that debt, in an attempt to get that borrower on track. There's also the FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, when there could be consumer credit reporting related to a borrower who might be delinquent. And then there's also the idea of fair servicing. I think a lot of us in the industry have heard about fair lending for decades. When I talk to companies about fair servicing and do you have a program in place to treat borrowers fairly and equally on the servicing side, a lot of companies ask me if fair servicing is even a thing. And so let me assure you that it is. And the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and Regulation B apply to a borrower all the way through the loan cycle not just when that loan is originated, but while it's being serviced as well. And there's a couple of areas where fair servicing issues could come into play. One is with fees. For example, a borrower might be late with the payment and might be assessed a late fee. Well, what happens often is a borrower might, a borrower might call in and request that their late fee be waived. They're ready to make the payment. They'd like the late fee waived. Well, here's something to think about for loans that you're servicing. What happens if some borrowers call and ask for their fee to be waived and it gets waived and other borrowers might call and talk to a different representative who thinks the policy of the company is not to waive fees. So those borrowers requests are denied. And now imagine that the borrowers who are having their request denied might be disproportionately members of a minority group. And you can already begin to see how there could be potential fair servicing issues. Similarly, when borrowers apply for loss mitigation, many applications come in incomplete. What are the steps taken by a servicer to get those incomplete applications complete? Are all borrowers followed up with in the same manner and the same number of times to get those applications complete? Once they are complete, are you looking at the loss mitigation outcomes to see if people in different racial, ethnic, and gender groups are getting similar results for borrowers who are in similar credit situations. Finally, in addition to laws with performing loans and delinquent loans, there's the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that has their own set of servicing rules and regulations that apply from soup to nuts, from performing loans to delinquent loans, starting when loans are first boarded or transferred, a lot of rules related to borrowers who become delinquent and how they're notified assigning a single point of contact, maintaining that contact with the borrower through a process that will hopefully lead to the borrower retaining their home. But then even if a loan goes into foreclosure or if the borrower's in bankruptcy, there are still laws and rules that apply. And for example, with foreclosure, that may stop foreclosure proceedings if a loss mitigation application comes in time. So again, to summarize this, when we think about MSRs and you have a portfolio of loans, it's a great thing. There's a lot of opportunity, but again, only if those loans are being serviced compliantly. And that's one thing that MQMR does to provide a lot of value for our clients, which is to help you navigate this regulatory compliance landscape, which is enormous and ever-changing. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so one point about those of you who may be a master servicer and you have a subservicer who is servicing your loans for you. As I mentioned, that does not absolve you of any responsibility to ensure that the loans in your portfolio are serviced compliantly with all of the laws and regulations that I just mentioned. All agency requirements from, for example, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA, you have to comply with all of them. And in this context, that means you need to make sure your subservicer is compliant. So how do you do that? The biggest thing is to have a robust policy of oversight and management. So how do you do that? You need to make sure that you are getting data, information, and reports from your subservicer on a regular basis. There could be things that you need to get daily from them or weekly or monthly. And hopefully you have access to the system that your subservicer is using so that you could go in and look at loans if needed. But the point is you need to be able at any one time, for example, if someone's coming out and doing an examination of you to know how that subservicer is performing, not just the status of the loans, how many are current, how many are 30 days, 60 days or 90 days delinquent, but how are they doing with compliance? What about consumer complaints? Is the subservicer getting a lot of complaints about their service? And are those complaints tracked? Do you get something from them that tells you about the loans in your portfolio if the borrowers may have submitted a complaint. So the first thing you need to do is make sure you're getting data and information, and then you need to make sure that it's accurate. And you need to look at those reports and discuss it at your organization. You may need to give your subservicer feedback about any of a number of things in order to make sure that they, if needed, do a better job, perform better, and more compliantly when servicing your loans. And as Julie mentioned earlier, where if you're not doing QC of loans, you don't know what your risk is. If you are not constantly managing and having oversight over your subservicer, then you're in that category Julie mentioned of unknowable risk, which I agree wholeheartedly is the worst kind of risk because you don't even know what it is that you need to fix or improve. Next slide, please. Okay, and so finally for me, a couple of quick points about what's coming. We've talked already about what is, what are the current laws and regulations that are out there that govern mortgage servicing that you need to comply with, whether you're a master servicer servicing yourself or using a subservicer. Well, I mentioned one of the big areas already, which is fair servicing. It's a critically important area and one that regulators, especially at the CFPB, are focusing on very heavily. I talked about fee waivers earlier, as well as loss mitigation applications and outcomes. If you take a step back from that, if there's any part of the process of servicing loans where there is discretion or where there could be different decisions or outcomes that are made, that's where you want to make sure that you have a robust fair servicing policy and program and that you're analyzing data. Are you analyzing fees and requests for waivers? Analyzing applications that came in incomplete? Analyzing your loss mitigation outcomes? And as part of that analysis, looking at the race, gender, ethnicity, age of the borrowers who were maybe getting fees waived or, get, or not getting them waived, or applications that are incomplete that get complete versus not getting complete, and if any of this sounds like something that your organization might not be doing or you're not sure if you're doing it right or if you're doing enough, please reach out to us because we can help you with that program. Two other last points. One is that the CFPB has talked for a while now about wanting to streamline their servicing regulations and make them a little bit easier for servicers to comply with. Sounds good. Hopefully that will actually be the case. Well, I just heard an update from the Bureau at a conference a couple weeks ago. They expect that the new proposed CFPB servicing regulations will be published in April, which is a couple short months away. They said it might spill over into May, but they're pretty sure that those proposed regs will be published in April. And that's an opportunity for all of us to review those, provide comments and feedback, but we also know the final rules 
will be very similar to those proposed rules. So we'll get an idea of what the changes are. So before I turn this over to the next speaker, Natalie, I just want to sort of put a bow on this by saying, with MSRs, there's a lot of opportunity. And when we talk about regulations, there's one more quick one I want to mention, which is for large banks, Basel III, there were some new regulations that were proposed in July of last year. What's important about it from our perspective, even though none of us may be at a large bank, is that it lowers the threshold for banks to need to comply with Basel III to those with 100 million billion, excuse me, billion in assets or more, which brings a whole bunch of banks into play. And what that means is they need to reserve more capital. And they need to do it for pools of loans that might be available for sale, not just loans under the current rules that they were holding in their own portfolio to maturity. They'll need to, in their capital calculation requirements, um, set aside more capital if the LTV for the loans are higher, and they'll need to set aside capital for loans that are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and sold to them. So what all of that means is there may be a lot more pools of MSRs on the market for sale. Banks not, might not want to reserve all the capital for what they have now. So that will create opportunity for all of you to start a portfolio or increase it. And again, uh, our colleagues at MCT and us at MQMR can help you every step of the way with what you're trying to do at your organization. And so speaking of MSRs and pools, I'm going to turn it over to Natalie, who will give us a lot of helpful information on the different types of valuations of MSR portfolios. All yours, Natalie. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so yeah, so as Scott mentioned, I am going to be covering the three main types of MSR valuations, just because there can often be confusions on the differences between them. So first up, we have um, market value. So as the name suggests, the valuation um, does use current market assumptions. And these are assumptions used when brokering a, a bulk sale. So because these assumptions can vary greatly depending on the current bulk market, uh, they can be quite volatile. Next up, we have fair value. So this is the value that's typically used for accounting purposes and are generally what third-party valuation providers are delivering to their clients. So when an MSR bulk sales are you know, actively trading, I'd say fair value is fairly in line with the market value. I think, you know, as Ada was alluding to that um, as well too. You know, however, when the market's uh, not as active, you know, assumptions do have to be made and um, the valuations are basically valued as if, as if it were active. Um, and this is just because fair value analysis is not entirely dependent on the current bulk market. Fair value assumptions also rely on, you know, general industry wide assumptions, you know, with quarterly checks, for example, um, using broker surveys to name one way, um, you know, assumptions are kept in line with the rest of the industry. All that is to say, you know, fair value assumptions, you know, do not change as often and are not dictated by the current market, meaning the value is much more stable than a market value would be. And, and finally, we have economic value. So this is a valuation that takes a company's actual servicing costs, their earning and advance rates, you know, yields, just to name a few, and uses those company-specific assumptions to produce cash flows that would actually reflect the company's actual advances, you know, earnings and costs. These valuations are crucial in a retained versus release decisioning uh, because you are able to analyze the economic cash flows against a released value, really in order to determine an accurate best X of that loan. Um, and on the next slide, uh, we actually have a graph of the recent retained versus release trends. If um, you can go to the next slide, thank you. Uh, and so in this graph, you can see we have uh, the retained percentages in orange in the middle here, and then with the aggregator pricing on top in the, the lighter blue, and then the co-issue pricing at the bottom in the dark blue. So as you can see, um, the percentages of retained versus release can be you know, a bit volatile, you know, however, this graph you know, does show that they have been trending at least this past year with you know, retained taking roughly 30% of the market and release taking that remaining 70%. Uh, and broken out in January here at the end, you can see that the aggregators um, of that released market were winning 60% and then the co-issue roughly 10%. Um, I do just want to point out that you know, we have actually um, not too long ago seen these numbers reversed with, you know, retain being 70% of the market, you know, during COVID. So, you know, it is very important to continually monitor these trends and, and how it might affect your retained versus release decisioning. 
Um, but with that being said, I will hand it over to David now to talk about the current bulk market. Okay, well, it looks like we might have some uh, technical difficulties. I'll uh, just take a few minutes here. We've only got five minutes left uh, and talk a little bit about the uh, the bulk market. Uh, it, it's a very active market right now. We, uh, uh, starting out uh, the year, have a number of deals that are in our pipeline. Uh, oftentimes, uh, holders of MSR uh, ask the question, is it the right time to sell? And, um, you know, values for existing portfolios are very, very strong. Uh, we saw, you know, already this year multiples in the four and a half uh, to one range, uh, which is uh, very, very healthy. We do anticipate uh, that uh, the bulk market will be strong through the first uh, couple of quarters at least, uh, but we've been very uh, surprised and pleased with how active it's been, and uh, we anticipate it con continuing for into the, uh, the next few months. So let's move on to the next slide, David, and I'll hit on a, a few of these other uh, key points. Yeah, so bottom line is, you know, overall mortgage production, that's certainly uh, uh, impacting how uh, holders of MSR are thinking about that asset. Uh, we know that the, uh, the servicers actually fared well in uh, 2023 uh, during a very tough, tough So, for more. that asset is to uh, a lot of for mortgage companies and obviously compressed margins and lower contributing to lower cash flow but if you've got cash flow is uh, companies a lot of uh, new entrants into the space that are grow their their uh, their you know allocation of MSR on their own balance sheet so that is actually helping uh, maintain strong uh, yes uh, I, I'm getting a little breaking up a little bit. Yes. If I could just ask you to uh, turn off your camera, so hopefully that'll fix any uh, any any issues uh, on your end, maybe on the Wi-Fi or something. Now. Still. Sorry, Bill. You're, you're breaking up a little bit. Bill, can you uh, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, David, I could jump in if you want. Yeah, that would that would be great as well. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's like having some technical yeah. difficulties. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, generally speaking, uh, there is a lot of interest in MSRs right now. We're seeing that uh, coming in from uh, different sources that we haven't seen in the past. And recently, we are seeing more interest from hedge funds, investment uh, companies jumping on the bandwagon and trying to acquire MSR, either through direct investment in MSR versus uh, investing in companies, uh, lenders, servicers, and so forth. Uh, so it, we definitely expect a robust market. And obviously, the prices for MSR are all determined by the net worth of the seller, uh, other components, loan characteristics that will drive the price as well, just like I alluded to earlier. And we definitely anticipate those multiples north of four multiple, close to five multiple as we head into the second, ha uh, second quarter of this year. So hopefully that trend will continue. Uh, it's difficult to say whether we're gonna see the five and a half multiple that we experienced towards uh, the end of Q3, early Q4, uh, because of rates have started moving lower and with Fed's action to lower interest rate, that could kind of end that uh, event. So we definitely see north of four multiple to four and a half multiple, but definitely a robust market in 2024. And thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity and my teammates as well. Thank you all. Awesome, appreciate it, Azad. Uh, looks like we've got one more slide here. If you if you maybe want to take that one over as well. 
Sure. Uh, MSR uh, ownership, uh, obviously, it has advantages and disadvantages. The advantages, uh, the general picture of uh, owning MSR, it increases the inter enterprise value. Uh, that's why we started seeing more uh, companies, asset managers, jumping in because they realize how worthwhile to have this asset. Banks, for instance, independent lenders, credit union, it expands and enlarges their customer base. They could offer, especially with uh, banking, they could offer them cross-selling opportunities, credit card, uh, different variety of product, insurance. All these things will generate additional revenue uh, from uh, 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 mortgage borrowers. So definitely, uh, you know, it's an advantage to have. At the same time, the interest, you know, servicing fee interest that is coming in, you can think of it as an annuity coming in. Generally speaking, we see anywhere between 40 to $60 per loan uh, per year, that uh, net, basically net income coming in from servicing is definitely worthwhile. The disadvantages, depending on the type of remittance, but it is a cash intensive operation, uh, potential impairment exposure, potential fair value, especially uh, fair value decline as race decline, that will have a fair value write down. So all these factors will play in uh, and impacts the balance sheet and income statement. If your uh, investor remittances like Jenny May or MBS, you could have potential exposure from cash advances. And also if loans become delinquent and goes into foreclosure, there's a lot of loss mitigation responsibilities that were addressed earlier by Scott. Uh, it needs to be monitored and it needs to be managed properly. And again, just like what Scott discussed, Basel III, CFPB regulatories, all those factors play in and it's very uh, resource intensive also so you need staffing all that will play a role awesome thank you so much azad really appreciate it um and and again you know um what a great webinar and you know we just like to thank mqmr um for joining us here for this awesome webinar and special shout out to julie and scott and azad and natalie and bill um for helping make this a success and uh, in case you missed it at the beginning, we will be sending out a recording and a slide deck after uh, this webinar. Um, and if we didn't get to your question, I know there was, there was one or two that we wanted to follow up on um, after the webinar, so we'll be planning on doing that as well. Um, but uh, we've got the contact info on the screen for you right now, too, if you'd like to reach out. But uh, again, thank you so much, and thank you, everybody, for joining. I uh, really appreciate it, and thank you to our presenters as well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.